Chairman Eric Tarr, he joins us via telephone. Eric, good morning. Thanks so much for being with us. Hey, good morning, Ron. I mean, Ron. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, see. Thanks for having me on. Your your name is Eric, E R I C, and your phone wouldn't know to change that to anything other than like Erie, you know, like yeah, like, like it, Erie, right? You know, in, in this position, you get called so many things. Well, I am. So, yeah, so I respond about everything. I I imagine as an elected official, you get called a few things, depending on who's calling you those things. That that's uh, absolutely correct. Yeah. Hey, uh, first and foremost, as we approach the end of October, do you have any ideas, uh, information as to how revenue numbers will look in October? Yeah, you know, I think we're going to come in pretty close to the estimates on it. We're, uh, the, the most recent numbers I have in were from two days ago, the 24th. Um, we have about $300 million in collections so far. Uh, we have about $170 million that's came in on our income tax, which means we've got about $9 million more to go to hit the estimate. Mm-hmm. Um, and something on the income tax piece that's, um, you know, we've, we've said it, you've heard a lot of people talking about it, is even though we did a 21 and a quarter percent income tax cut for the quarter, we're dead even on income tax collections. So that, that kind of speaks to um, the employment in the state because we added about 125,000 jobs over the past 38 months in West Virginia. And that uh, and wages have went up with a GDP increase of about 15.2 percent uh, coming at the end of uh, 2022 when we had those numbers. So, which was the second in the country, second fastest, fastest rate of growth in the country. So, it's um, income tax is doing really, really well, even with the income tax cut. Our sales tax collections, uh, they're at about 120 million. We're about two million shy of, of revenue estimate. I'm going to realize we still have one week left of our four week month here uh, for these collections. And then, but our biggest thing right now is our severance. Our severance is a, a negative 60 million, which is the first time that kind of alarming when I saw a negative, but. Um, but it gets back to this uh, first month of the quarter, and the reimbursements to the counties on severance tax go out first before we get into what comes actually into the state on the collections off of severance. And um, severance has been, activity-wise, is really strong. Uh, we're moving a lot of gas, moving a lot of coal, but the prices are kind of um, bottom of the barrel right now. So, so it's not uh, as collect- – the collections aren't as strong as you would see at these kind of volumes usually. So, but, uh, but that, should, that should straighten up, too, by the end of the month. Uh, I, I'm curious in regards to severance because if, if I remember correctly, the uh, teachers unions wanted to tie in PEIA funding to severance tax collections, I think about four or five years ago when we were uh, going through that stretch. And I think uh, this, uh, Craig Blair, who I think at the time was the Senate finance chairman, warned about trying to tie in with those, uh, those revenues because they're, they're just not revenues you can count on from quarter to quarter. No, you know, it's um, there's you, the thing that you can count on with severance. So there's there's a spot of it that you can count on. There's a spot that you can't. And the the thing for me personally, when I look at it, is go back and look at you know, a couple decades of history, and on average, what's the percentage of the revenue that comes in relative to severance tax? And so, given that history, usually severance is about eight and a half percent of the revenue that would come into the state of West Virginia. And so your your valleys and your spikes can be extreme with severance, as we're seeing right now. So, you know, and, and as we just come off of, you know, severance collections have been just, they've been above the clouds recently. Mm-hmm. And at some point, they got to come down. And so now they, they are coming down, and, and you see the, these wild swings. And so what you don't want to do is tie a stable expense to an incredibly unstable revenue source. And really, the only thing, the only part of stability that I would argue from the finance year position is that eight and a half percent of your revenue side. And now that's changing because I think that's going to drop. And it's not because of the drop in severance; it's because that our economy is now diversifying, which is what we want in West Virginia. We're finally getting a diverse economy where we don't live and die on severance tax. And so, as that happens, um, you know, the, it's that, that eight and a half percent is likely to drop as an overall percentage of our revenue. Uh, and we want that. We want that. We still want the severance in West Virginia. We want that, that those industries to thrive, and I believe they're going to continue to grow. Uh, we've got a lot more gas production in the state and more coming. Uh, we also have more technologies that, that require coal around around the carbon technologies, like uh, for graphene and graphite. So I think you're going to see still a lot of booms and opportunities in those industries, but we have such a broad scale of industry coming to West Virginia now that we that, that diversification of our revenue sources decreases the overall percentage that severance contributes. 
There was a point brought up to me by a local accountant who said that he was aware of, and he does payroll for people, he, he was aware of some places that had not yet enacted the new state income tax rates. Eric, have you heard anything about this around the state? That is the first I've heard of it. Um, you know, with anything new, though, it, it wouldn't surprise me that somebody would have not adjusted their you know, their, their tax documents. Anytime you go through, and this is a major change, and it has been, it's been a discussion for a while, and then we finally achieved an income tax reduction. And with that change, I would imagine anybody's got their nose to the ground just trying to figure out how to, you know, keep the payroll rolling. They miss something like that when they're worried about just how to um, do their business. So I imagine there would be some here and there, but I can't imagine it's with any great volume. I would hope not, because I imagine you're basing some of the revenues that you're collecting on an assumption that people have enacted the new income tax rates. Oh, sure. Absolutely. Yes. Hey, I wanted to ask you also about uh, your confidence level in the use of funds in the state of West Virginia, misuse of funds, any corruptions with the, with the spending of funds in the state of West Virginia and your concerns about that. You know, it's getting better. My my biggest concerns about corruptions with funds within the state of West Virginia came relative to the bolus of, of COVID money that came in. And prior to us enacting legislation that restricted, um, pr- prior to us passing legislation that gave the legislature control of, of unanticipated federal dollars, prior to that, when those monies came in, the governor had um, just – unabridged authority to go in and spend that money as how, how he will without legislative oversight. And so when COVID came and you started seeing actually billions of dollars dropping down from the federal government um, to go into spending, the legislature came back and said, well, we're going to limit the governor's authority to spend those unanticipated federal funds to $150 million. Anything after that, he's going to have to go. Problem is that that legislation was enacted after we'd already received hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of millions of dollars. And so when that went out, you start, you saw stuff like the baby dog sweepstakes. You saw stuff like the governor transferring money over into his gifts and charities funds. Um, and you saw what we just saw come out to this, the indictments that start rolling through, which, um, you know, our Senate finance committee, when we started seeing some stuff that was just like, this makes no sense whatsoever and started asking the U S uh, office of the inspector general, start looking at things. Um, I expected that it would probably give a a bigger audit of things across West Virginia. I think we're starting to see some of the fruit of that uh, coming from this indictment of Tim Pretty. Um, and I'm sure that this is probably tip of the iceberg as you start getting into and looking at these indictments roll down as they start looking how these funds were used. And in that instance, what happened um, is that the was reported as a contract for fifty for five hundred thousand dollars, or excuse me, five hundred thousand. Uh, COVID test when they actually used 50,000 and which uh, related uh, ended up being $34 million worth of embezzlement. And that's, uh, you know, that's, and that's just a, that's a tiny, tiny, tiny percentage of the billions that have come in. So I think that as more and more has looked at this, I think you're going to see the corruption in it um, come, come to light. I hope all of it does. That was, the, you know, the intent of the four and a half hour finance committee meeting we had over the interim sessions, or actually not interim sessions, like during a regular session. Um, so we'll um, we'll see. You know, I think uh, that we there's definitely from this finance chair, from the Senate president, who has been a stickler on it with uh, Craig Blair, going after um, this type of stuff to say, you know, we're not any for any oversight we have the legislature. If we can stop it, we're going to stop it. State Auditor J.B. McCuskey's been on it as well. But, you know, uh, for me, this has been um, this has been Governor Justice just being a complete lack of leadership from his office, having having no hands on and all this down at the um, institutional level, the agency level, rather just putting his buddies from high school or wherever over top of agencies and waiting for them to crash before they put somebody with talent and expertise in place that actually can run a system. And so a lot of this is the fault from the executive. Uh, you, can't, you can't cover it all from the legislature. And uh, um, we need somebody. Who, whoever comes in this next governor's race, I hope to goodness they're present, and I hope they're an operator and because these agencies need it. Matt Harvey. Good morning, Senator Tarr. Um, Good morning. 
and and you may not know or you may know and you can't say and it may be too early but th- that 34 million dollars is is and i didn't read the indictment i apologize is is it known where it went well uh i don't know the exact details of where it went i just know that the person that was re- i guess uh, found responsible for being able to award that contract and knowingly paying for more than was received was laid at tim pretty's shoulders was was it alleged in the indictment whether he was or was it reported on that he was getting some sort of financial kickback from from approving fraudulent vouchers i can't speak to that um from personal knowledge that he personally got a kickback from it i know that they're um around that it also triggered an investigation into voad um which is um it's a voluntary organization for assistance in disasters which you know, runs billions of dollars as well um, in fact when back when we had the 2016 flood the governor turned all of those monies that the state had over into voad and now we're starting to see that you know tim pretty was uh, uh i think he was on the board of voad at that time as well and you're starting to see some um accusations i think charges that are starting to, to brew up now there in voad where that organization, it was systemic as well, where they were using those funds to buy furniture and fixtures for their own houses rather than applying it to flood relief. Um, and also going through and um, having cards and stuff that they would spend the monies for personal use instead of uh, instead of actually putting it toward flood relief. So, you know, those, as, as you see these kind of dollars come in, that which are have been historic, and it's um, they're historic relative to historic disasters. As that relief comes in, um, the system of checks and balances has failed in many areas. Now, it's small percentages of the overall dollars, as far as we can tell. You know, if you, for instance, you might have, um, I think we had about one point, well, one point six billion. I think it came through. One point seven billion came through in one of the the COVID relief in two in two tranches, uh, the ARPA funds. And so if you, you look at that, you know, for anybody who's not really a numbers person, a billion, that's a thousand million dollars, right? Just one billion is a thousand million. So when somebody is in that and they've never seen those kind of funds, and now they're in there, I, I imagine somebody who is uh, less than um, a person of integrity is going to go in and then when they're thinking, well, who's going to miss $10 million out of $2,000 billion? And I think that, that that kind of thing for the people in the wrong places, receiving all that money at one time, looking at that nobody's going to miss this much, it creates too much opportunity um, that happens. And so we, we have to have those checks and balances to go back and hold those people responsible and accountable because what if we don't, it gives permission to abuse much, much, much more funds. And these are, these are taxpayer dollars. You know, it's the government prints money, but the reality is the only way they get money is they pull it out of your paycheck. And so whether it's a state or whether it's the feds, it's your taxes that somebody is taking directly from your pocket and sticking it right in theirs. And that's not the intended purpose. Mr. Gilstrap, <clears throat> I get paid to put together plots and conspiracies, and, I've, and I think it's hard to misplace $34 million. Um, if, if, it, if it didn't end up in somebody's bank account, it went somewhere. Is, is there an effort? What is the effort or maybe you don't know to track that money down and also to you know where it happens in one agency it's not inconceivable to assume that it's happening in other agencies so is there a a total government audit going on to find out just how much of this these tranches of money have been spent properly and or just disappeared yeah i love that question because i still try to find all the resources for how to audit the funds myself even from the finance chair position um, so one of the things that we did, there's, there's several avenues for the audits. One is the United States Office of the Inspector General. Um, and there's, there's three inspector generals that I'm aware of for our region within that office. And that's where we initiated it from the Senate Finance Committee to go in and say, look, you know, from the federal side of it, you guys have federal rules around this. We think that those rules have been violated and that people have specifically benefited, such as the governor moving it over for essentially to use it as a glorified campaign account with his gifts and charities fund. 
um, start here and take a look at it. Well, this is the first indictment we've seen coming down out of those COVID monies, which um, has to do with the COVID testing. Um, and I think that we'll see more there. Another spot that, that you'll see it is with the state auditor's office. Um, Auditor J.V. McCuskey has something called Open Checkbook down there. It's something that he implemented. And every every check the state writes goes through the auditor's office. And so um, he can go in and, and pull things together that just don't make sense. And so I know that uh, he is frequently putting out letters to question the governor's office on it related to how dollars are spent around these COVID dollars. And specifically, it was around testing. I know he sent out for the uh, the volume of tests that were ordered relative to um, the test that actually came back positive back when all this uh, the tests were starting to roll through those numbers weren't making sense to him so he he had uh, was questioning that we also have some called the legislative auditor the legislative auditor is from a joint committee of the House and Senate and so the the legislature itself can initiate an investigation that has pretty far reaching authority. Um, that we can go into and look all the way from stuff within governance and, and uh, government agencies, uh, within the body itself, within individuals in the state, when we think that there is um, either a system failure, uh, corruption, or anything else that we just think needs to be, um, or a system improvements needed, we can put the legislative audit in there to go investigate um, specific scenarios and see if there's changes we need to make or if there's people we need to hand that information off to, such as prosecutors. Um, then we also have something uh, called the, the um, Joint Committee on Investigations. And the Joint Committee on Investigations, which is CSI, is what they refer to it around the legislature, is that you can have um, any given legislator um, or somebody in government who can send in a complaint to that committee, a formal complaint, and, and have something investigated in, in private. And you know, those, those, those meetings are some of the ones that are closed-door meetings, because when they start the investigation, the investigation itself, whether merited or not, can have pretty serious implications on the person who's being investigated. So um, there's a lot of ways that these audits kind of cross paths um, uh, where there's redundancy in the audits. And then there's some where, you know, uh, for instance, maybe the state auditor really doesn't have all the authority the legislative auditor might have. So there's a, there's a lot of avenues. And, and it, um, it seems like recently, about every day, I'm having a conversation with one or the other. So. I just want to take a step back. Uh, in the early part of that comment, you mentioned the governor's gifts and charities um, fund. Are you suggesting that there was anything in the use of that money that that danced around illegality? Well, that was the questions of the committee, and so and and, and my question of the the office of the inspector general. You know, the letter that I'd sent out um, posed several questions. One is that was this an appropriate use of the funds, and if it's not appropriate, was it a legal use of the funds? And if it was a legal use of the funds, was it an ethical use of the funds? And so those, those are the questions that really went out to um, the Office of the Inspector General and the Ethics Commission and, and to the Southern District Prosecutor. And the only person I ever heard back from uh, was the actually Office of the Inspector General. And what I got back from there is that none of these people can tell you they're investigating, by the way. You know, so even, even, even if you're, as a chairman of the, the West Virginia Finance Committee and the State Senate. If I file a complaint with one of these agencies, or my entire committee, or the body files a complaint, these institutions cannot tell us whether or not they are actually investigating it. Um, so what happens? What's happened since, though, is I've had the Office of the Inspector General call our Senate Finance Office, my, my office, and ask questions that I. Um, to send them information that I know they have. They know I know they have it. So uh, so I know there are ongoing investigations into this governor. Is one of those investigations the situation with the money that was used for the Marshall baseball field, Eric, or did that die on the vine? I, I don't know. I mean, we questioned it. That's specifically what we questioned, um, is, is that what happened was, in, in that story, is that the Department of Corrections, say the Department of Corrections, which you guys know is, has gone through, like many other governor's agencies that have just been, you know, had, had catastrophic failures within them systemically since he took office. Um, 
what he, they had co- they had expenses directly related to COVID. Those expenses were reimbursed, and then subsequently, it was claimed from the governor's office to reimburse them again. But since they had already reimbursed them, instead of sending them to the Department of Corrections, they took the funds, didn't put them back in the general fund, didn't put them in the Department of Corrections, and they put them in the, the governor's gifts, donations, and charities account, which is uh, at the governor's discretion to spend. And the most that had ever been in that account that we could find on record was $250,000. And, I, and I'm trying, I, I may have the, the exact number wrong, but I think he moved $17 million over to that account. It might have been more. I can't, I can't remember exactly what it was now. I'm trying to recall that one. Usually I'm pretty good with those numbers, but it's been a while now. So what ha- then, then they moved, he moved $10 million of that to Marshall, and they turned it into an you know, AstroTurf down there at Marshall. Um, so it's it's um, it was incredibly questionable. It's just um, and it, it threw up red flags at the auditor's office. It threw up red flags at our Senate Finance Committee, and we brought every secretary in the state and questioned them around um, conversations with the governor's office on the COVID dollars. And we had conversations for four and a half hours. We had the governor's counsel, um, Berkeley Bentley, in there questioning him. The governor, of course, didn't come up himself. Sent his counsel uh, come up and represent. We questioned. The Ethics Commission, and um, it was it was it was a lengthy day in the Joint Finance Committee going through trying to get some of these answers, and it resulted in uh, that letter that went to the Office of the Inspector General. The the governor, there's, there's a lot of these little issues, and some of them aren't little they're, they're, as they continue to grow. But there are so many of these types of things around the governor, with money, his own finances, uh, use of funds, and such, and yet his approval rating in the state is still incredibly high. There's a complete separation there, like the old Teflon, uh, what they used to call John Gotti, the Teflon Don, right? So there's a complete separation there between all of these items and how the people feel about him. Can you explain that? You know, it's, uh, it, it blows my mind because, but I have a front row seat to it, you know, and I think this (laughs) is, here's, here's my, the way that I explain it to myself, I guess is I have a front row seat as as a legislator and a legislator in leadership to the negotiations and activities of the governor, um, at least in his role as governor. And he is probably the largest disappointment of somebody who comes into a seat that I ever have had in my political career, in that he's absent and first and foremost, or how he takes care of his buddies in secretary positions ahead of what's best for the state of West Virginia, so much so that it'll crash agencies that take care of our most, our absolute most vulnerable, our our children in child protective services. I mean, we got federal lawsuits over that everywhere. Our state police, our Department of Corrections, uh, DHHR. And when the legislature would lay a heavy hand to go in and say, you need to get rid of this secretary, your longtime buddy, his go-to response is protect his buddy until he absolutely has to change it because it has felt so miserably that you've got to get somebody with some expertise over that area and actually put him as a decent secretary, which is what happened with state police. Jack Chambers, absolute best selection of a state superintendent for police you'll ever find. But it took an absolute embarrassment of the state police to get the governor to actually take action to put somebody who should be in that position in the position. And that's just one example. So that's what I see from the front row. What the people see is the old golly shucks with a beautiful dog out across the state. He talks to you like your uncle or your grandpa. He, he puts on this uh, complete act of, of, um, endearment to you and it's an act the guy's a genius salesman but he is a narcissistic pathological liar so it's i think that that salesmanship to the public is incredible he he is a master at it and then you have the people who really don't pay close attention to the politics you know so you and I, the people here probably listen to your radio show, we pay, we pay close attention to politics. And for that reason, you're going to see the people who show up in a Republican primary 
they're going to say there's absolutely no way I'm voting for that joker because they know him. And then you've got the people whose general public who, who don't have time to pay to politics. Their life's better. Their blood pressure's lower. But what they're worrying about, you know, is, is anything but politics. What their, what their perception is, is how's the state doing? Well, the state is doing great in, in very large part to your senator that you've sent down here to Craig Blair, president of the Senate. That man has led legislative efforts for years up there now that have led to an incredible economic prosperity across the state. So much so what happens is that prior to going into a legislative session, we'll come in between the House and Senate leadership, lay down 20 or 30 bills in front of the governor and say, which ones do you want to be governor bills? He takes his. They look like governor initiatives. He's going to go out and champion these bills. Not one of them is his, his idea. And then he takes them out as governor's bills, we, and those are bills that we all know we can agree upon. And that legislation has produced to some of the, the, the most free that people in West Virginia have ever been. It's produced some of the most hope that you've ever seen in this state. And it's seen some of the most prospect, prosperous times the state's ever seen. 2022, second fastest growing gross domestic product in the country at 15.2% with wage growth that matched it. We've never seen that in West Virginia. And so what the people experience are this, these great economic prosperous times with ribbon cutting after ribbon cutting after ribbon cutting. And the governor gets to go out and market that as owning it when we did it in spite of him. Senator Tarr, thank you very much for your time this morning. A rather sobering wrap-up to that half hour. Appreciate well, your well. frankness. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thanks for having me on, guys. Thanks, Senator. Take care. Senate Finance Chairman Eric Tarr.